open the 20th IISS Shangri-La Dialogue. I would like to thank Acting Prime Minister Lawrence Wong for having hosted us last night for the opening keynote address of this 20th anniversary dialogue that was delivered by Prime Minister Albanese. And I'm delighted again to say how many delegations are here this year and how many are led by their defense minister. In a moment, we'll uh, begin the first plenary session on the United States' leadership uh, in the Indo-Pacific. But before that, I need to remind everybody here that all the speeches delivered here from the plenary and all the answers given to questions are on the record. It's equally the case that all the questions asked are on the record, so assume a certain responsibility for your own reputation as you ask that question because it might be cited in public as well uh, when uh, people uh, hear it and react to it. If you do want to uh, ask a question or make a comment, please make it crisp. In my experience, a short question and a crisp uh, comment will inspire uh, a more interesting uh, answer. And if you wish to take the floor, you will all notice that all 575 people in this room have a microphone set in front of them. You all have a badge. There are two things that you need to do if you would like to ask a question. The first is place your badge into the slot on the right-hand side of the microphone set. And the second, turn on your microphone. It will then turn green, and your name will appear on my list here. And I might choose you then to make a crisp comment or ask a precise question. I will know where you're sitting because I have a map here. And I already see that four or five experienced delegates at the Shangri-La Dialogue have already sought uh, the floor. It is likely that by the time the Secretary of Defense completes his remarks, I will see 40 or 50 green dots here. And you will understand my need to choose in a diverse way the variety of participants who might be able to uh, seek the floor. But I'm glad that that tradecraft has been learned by the experienced delegates here, and I hope, given that it's only a two-step process, that it shouldn't defeat the intellect of all of those of you who are gathered here. Be reassured that while your microphone will turn green, it is not on, it is not a hot mic, it's only when I press the right button here that it will turn red, at which point it does become a hot mic, but I retain the sovereign authority to turn it off uh, if I believe that you are not following my initial direction to be uh, crisp and short. So there we are for housekeeping uh, remarks. And now that it is approaching uh, 8.35, uh, it's possible for me to introduce uh, our uh, opening speaker. And while it sounds like a mere courtesy, it's true from the bottom of my heart to say that it's again a real delight to have Lloyd Austin sitting beside me here on stage uh, at the Shangri-La Dialogue. Uh, he and I were speaking on the way here about the intensity of travel that uh, defense ministers and defense uh, secretaries around the world must uh, engage in. Uh, he's been in Japan. He has a couple of other trips to do. But we're delighted that he's here honoring the Shangri-La Dialogue uh, with his presence and ready to address us on a topic that is on everybody's mind, which is the United States strategic situation in the Indo-Pacific region. Mr. Secretary, that podium is yours. Thank you very much again for being with us. Well, good morning, everyone. It is indeed great to be back here for another Shangri-La Dialogue. 
Let me thank John and everyone at IISS for their efforts to deepen our dialogue on the Indo-Pacific. You know, this is my third time speaking in Singapore at a IISS event. And so this is starting to be, this is becoming a habit there, John, so. I also want to thank our national host, Singapore, for your tremendous hospitality. It's great to see Senior Minister Teo and Minister Ung and other distinguished guests from our host here today. And I'm glad that we're joined by so many defense ministers and leaders from around the Indo-Pacific and around the world. One Minister of Defense made a special effort to be here today, That's my good friend Oleksiy Reznikov of Ukraine. Uh, Oleksiy's seat is currently empty. I'm sure he's working a room somewhere around here, but uh, Oleksiy, if you can hear me, I'd remind you that, I'd just tell you that your, your presence here reminds us that we can never take our peace and security for granted. I'm also delighted to be here with Director Haynes and many of our U.S. military leaders, and so thanks to everyone for being here today. This dialogue is always a great opportunity to exchange views. The only thing more wide-ranging than the conference agenda is a breakfast buffet. You know, this forum began two decades ago in a very difficult geopolitical climate. And today we're meeting at another moment of significant consequence. More and more, the countries of the Indo-Pacific have come together around a compelling vision of the future. And they're advancing it in unprecedented ways. It's a vision of a region in which all countries are free to thrive on their own terms without coercion or intimidation or bullying. It is a vision of a free and open and secure Indo-Pacific within a world of rules and rights. And that vision is anchored in some key principles. Respect for sovereignty. Adherence to international law. Transparency and openness the free flow of commerce and ideas, human rights and human dignity, equal rights for all states, large and small, and resolving disputes through peaceful dialogue and not coercion or conquest. You know, since the last time that I was in Singapore, we've made some tremendous progress towards our shared vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific. This is actually my seventh trip to the region as Secretary of Defense and my fourth trip to Southeast Asia. And each time, I've had the privilege to listen to leaders expressing their hopes for their countries and their people. And there, those conversations reinforce a simple truth. And that truth is that no one country can reach this future alone. As we all heard from Prime Minister Albanese last night, each country has a role to play. And the choices made by countries across the region reflect a deepening commitment to these shared principles. Throughout the Biden administration, we've demonstrated what my first speech in Singapore called the power of partnership. We've forged new friendships and deepened old alliances. We've reinforced deterrence to prevent conflict. We've defended the rules and norms that protect us all. And we've moved closer to that bright future that the people of this region want 
and the one that they deserve. So today I'd like to talk about the historic progress that we've made together over the past year. I'll talk about what the countries of the region are doing to fulfill that vision, what the United States is doing, and most importantly, what we're doing together. Now, clearly, we have much more to do. But our vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific is truly shared and truly achievable. You know, this vision isn't the vision of a single country or the initiative of a single country. It is a common and compelling aspiration. It's about building the basic conditions that let people live their lives without fear and pursue their dreams without limit. And that matters to citizens across the region. You know, some 60% of the world's young people live in this region. And they rightly demand the free flow of ideas. Fishing communities in the Philippines and Vietnam and the Pacific Islands depend on open waterways for their livelihood. And innovators here in Singapore depend on the rule of law to keep propelling the global economy forward. So these shared principles matter for men, women, and children all around this region. And they cannot be taken for granted. And neither can this region's security or prosperity be taken for granted. Just look at the crisis caused by Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. The Kremlin's indefensible war of choice stands as the bloodiest conflict in Europe since the end of World War II. And Russia's shocking aggression has brought home to people everywhere how dangerous our world would be if big countries could just invade their neighbors with impunity. Russia's invasion shows us all the dangers of disorder and the cost of chaos. And that's why so many countries represented here have supported Ukraine's brave defenders against Russia's war of imperial aggression. And that's why countries of the Indo-Pacific have cast their vote time and again for a future of peace, prosperity, and progress. This year, as president of the G7, Japan has focused on connectivity and on bridging the gap with developing countries. That includes pledging to invest $75 billion in public and private funds for regional infrastructure that can weather the storms of climate change. And India took the helm of the G20 and called on its members to work together to lift up the most vulnerable. And for the first time, India and ASEAN completed a new maritime exercise together. Last year, the Republic of Korea's Indo-Pacific strategy declared that international norms and international order were keys to our shared security and prosperity. Indonesia and Vietnam took bold steps toward resolving their maritime boundary dispute. And this is after 12 hard years of negotiation. So around the region, countries are matching their words with their actions. And they're insisting on resolving differences through dialogue and calling for even closer cooperation. And so are we. 
As you may know, I had a brief 41-year career in the U.S. Army. And I learned over and over again that alliances and partnerships make us all stronger. The United States is working together with our friends more closely every day. We're doubling down on our alliances and our partnerships. And our national defense strategy calls for us to work more closely with our allies and partners at every stage of defense planning. And so that spirit of partnership drove our work together to help the region recover from the worst days of the pandemic, including providing more than 360 million safe and effective vaccine doses. And that same spirit will help us tackle other shared threats from climate change to nuclear proliferation. And so our shared goals are clear, to deter aggression and to deepen the rules and norms that promote prosperity and prevent conflict. So we're stepping up planning and coordination and training with our friends from the East China Sea to the South China Sea to the Indian Ocean. And that includes staunch allies such as Australia, Japan, Republic of Korea, the Philippines, and Thailand. And it includes as well such valued partners as India, Indonesia, Vietnam, and clearly our host here today in Singapore. Consider the historic strides forward in the U.S.-Philippine alliance. As you've heard, the United States and the Philippines recently designated four new locations under our Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. And so this will let our forces work together to strengthen Philippine security, to continue to modernize the Philippine military, and to deliver humanitarian aid and disaster relief. We also recently completed the largest and most complex exercise Balakatan ever. More than 17,000 troops participated and that's nearly twice as many as last year. And for the first time, the exercise featured cyber elements, HIMARS rocket systems, and Patriot surface-to-air missiles. We're also st standing with our Japanese allies as they make historic changes to their national security strategy. This will mean major new investments in Japan's defense, including moves to develop a counter-strike capability. And we're upgrading our joint exercises like Keen Sword and Resolute Dragon to include more complex and realistic scenarios. We also salute the bold steps taken by Japan and the Republic of Korea to work more closely together. Strong ties between Tokyo and Seoul are good for both countries and for the region. We've made tremendous progress in our own uh, trilateral cooperation with Japan and the ROK, including more regular military exercises and greater information sharing. As North Korea continues its nuclear threats and missile tests and other dangerous provocations, we're deepen deepening our extended deterrence with our allies in the Republic of Korea. That includes increased deployments of our most advanced assets and the historic Washington de Declaration issued by President Biden and President Yoon. And we're cooperating more deeply than ever with the ROK on joint planning exercises and information sharing and more. At the same time, we're working closely with our allies 
to upgrade our force posture in the region. We're making our presence more distributed, more agile, and more resilient. And that will bring greater stability and security to the region. So we're committed to ensuring that every country can fly, sail, and operate wherever international law allows. And every country, large and small, must remain free to conduct lawful maritime activities. So we're modernizing our presence so that we can all continue to exercise these rights each and every day. We will forward station our 12th Marine Littoral Regiment, which is the most advanced formation in the United States Marine Corps in Japan by 2025 to deepen stability in the first island chain. We've committed to increase the rotational presence of U.S. forces in Australia, including rotations of fighters, bombers, task forces, as well as future rotations of ground and maritime capabilities. We're also deeply committed to ensuring that our allies and partners have the capabilities that they need to deter aggression and to increase stability. You see, more capable allies and, and partners magnify all of our security. So we're making extraordinary investments in our capabilities alongside our allies and partners to reinforce peace and prosperity in this region. President Biden's fiscal year 2024 budget, uh, its budget request, includes the largest procurement request in the history of the Department of Defense and the largest investment ever in research and development. His budget also includes a 40 percent increase over last year's request for the Pacific Deterrence Initiative. And that's an all-time high of $9.1 billion. We're making bold investments in air power, including an additional $61 billion for our F-35s and F-22s and uncrewed aircraft, and not to mention the B-21 Raider. And we're investing in an expanded fleet of subs, carriers, and destroyers as well as in, in space and cyberspace, and long-range fires, including hypersonics. And at every point, we are committed to sharing the advances that we've made to help our partners. For example, our initiative on critical and emerging technology with India Let's, uh, let's us explore new ways to co-develop key defense platforms. With Japan, we're working closely together on uncrewed combat air systems and counter hypersonics and air defense and missile defense technologies. With the Philippines, we're negotiating a new security sector assistance roadmap that will bring our alliance into a new era. And through the historic AUKUS partnership, we're co cooperating with Australia and the UK on a range of path-breaking capabilities. And of course, earlier this year, we announced how AUKUS will deliver conventionally armed, nuclear-powered submarines to Australia, all with the purpose of upholding peace and security. And just since 2020, we've invested nearly $1.2 billion in security cooperation funding to ensure that Indo-Pacific countries can detect malign actors and deter coercion. And so America's partnerships are bringing the region closer together 
to help keep it free and open and secure. And you can see that in new, in new forms of trilateral cooperation. The United States, Australia, and Japan are operating together more closely than ever and finding ways to enhance our science and technology cooperation. The United States, Japan, and the ROK are strengthening our interoperability and exploring ways to better share information about missile threats from North Korea. And later today, I'll talk with my Australian, Japanese, and Philippine counterparts about stronger cooperation, especially in the maritime domain. We've also made some important strides forward with Australia, India, and Japan through the Quad. And the Quad is strengthening its maritime cooperation and its work on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And all four Quad partners will participate in Exercise Malabar, which will take place off the coast of Australia for the first time this summer. In many of the regions, other top exercises are expanding as more countries come together around our shared principles, our shared principles. Last year, our annual Garuda Shield expanded from a bilateral exercise with Indonesia to include 14 countries with more than 4,000 troops. And this year, more than 19 flags will fly over Super Garuda Shield. Next month, er Exercise Talisman Sabre with Australia will bring 14 countries together it will be the largest iteration ever with more than 30,000 people participating, including a significant contingent from Japan. And it is yet another way that European countries like France and Germany and the UK are standing up for our shared values in the Indo-Pacific. And so, Building nimble coalitions to advance our shared vision makes the Indo-Pacific more stable and more resilient. The United States is absolutely proud to expand our cooperation with ASEAN. We remain staunch supporters of ASEAN centrality and the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. And we stepped up our work through the ASEAN Defense Minister's Meeting Plus, including new programs to support the next generation of Southeast Asian defense leaders. We're also continuing to expand our marquee maritime initiative with the Quad. The Indo-Pacific Partnership for Maritime Domain Awareness will help our partners across the region better monitor the waters near their shores. And that will help them combat illegal fishing and better respond to natural disasters. And finally, we're building important new ties in the Pacific Islands. We're working with our Pacific partners to combat illegal and unregulated and unreported fishing through more training and cooperation, such as the U.S. Coast Guard's Shiprider Program. We're working together to strengthen maritime domain awareness and expand the capacity of our Pacific Island partners. And we recently signed a, a historic defense cooperation agreement with Papua New Guinea. It will modernize our security cooperation and help us to provide humanitarian assistance, and disaster relief in the region. And so, ladies and gentlemen, our work together has made this region stronger and safer. Now, we understand the headwinds that we face, but we won't let those headwinds blow us off course. 
We will continue to stand by our allies and partners as they uphold their rights. We will maintain our vigorous respons and responsible presence across the Indo-Pacific. And we'll continue to work to ensure that no one country can assert control over shared waterways. In the South China Sea, we will continue to work with our allies and partners to uphold the freedom of navigation and overflight. And let me again underscore the importance of the 2016 ruling by the Arbitral Tribunal. It is legally binding and it is final. We won't be deterred by dangerous operational behavior at, or at sea or in international airspace. The People's Republic of China continues to conduct an alarming number of risky intercepts of U.S. and allied aircraft flying lawfully in international airspace. We've all just seen a, 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 another troubling case of aggressive and unprofessional flying by the PRC. So we will support our allies and partners as they defend themselves against coercion and bullying. To be clear, we do not seek conflict or confrontation, but we will not flinch in the face of bullying or coercion. Now, all of this is especially important in the Taiwan Strait. I also like to be clear about another point. The United States remains deeply committed to preserving the status quo in the Strait, consistent with our long-standing One China policy and with fulfilling our well-established obligations under the Taiwan Relations Act. Our policy is constant and firm. It is held true across U.S. administrations. And we will continue to categorically oppose unilateral changes to the status quo from either side. Also highlight that conflict is neither in imminent or inevitable. Deterrence is strong today. And it's our job to keep it that way. You know, the whole world has a stake in maintaining peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. The whole world. The security of commercial shipping lanes and global supply chains depend on, depends on it. And so does freedom of navigation worldwide. worldwide. But make no mistake, Conflict in the Taiwan Strait would be devastating. So we are determined to maintain peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. And so are a number of countries around other countries around the world, and that number continues to grow. President Biden has been clear. The United States does not seek a new Cold War. And competition must not spill over into conflict. And the region should never be split into hostile blocks. Instead, we're working to strengthen the guardrails against conflict and to redouble our diplomacy and to bolster peace and security and stability in the region. The United States believes that open lines of communication with the People's Republic of China are essential, especially between our defense and military leaders. For responsible defense leaders, the right time to talk is any time. The right time to talk is every time. And the right time to talk is now. Dialogue is not a reward. It is a necessity. And the 
cordial handshake over dinner is no substitute for a substantive engagement. And the more that we talk, the more we can avoid the misunderstandings and miscalculations that could lead to crisis or conflict. You know, I am deeply concerned that the PRC has been unwilling to engage more seriously on better mechanisms, mechanisms for crisis management between our two militaries. But I hope that will change, and soon. I've said it before, <coughs> and I'll say it again. Great powers must be beacons of transparency and responsibility. And the United States is deeply committed to doing our part. And we are determined to keep this region open, peaceful, and prosperous. Ladies and gentlemen, the Indo-Pacific has become an extraordinary example of human progress and peaceful cooperation. I'm proud to be here with you, and the United States is proud to be your partner. As I said before, conflict and strife are not inevitable, but peace and security are not automatic. The region's growing openness and prosperity show the work, the importance of working together and not allowing ourselves to be split apart. The people of the Indo-Pacific have a wider view and a wider vision. So together we can deepen the region's security Together we can expand the circle of opportunity, and together we can ensure that every citizen of this region has a chance to thrive. So let's continue to draw on the power of partnership. Let's continue to come together in common purpose. And let's continue to build a region prosperity, and openness, and freedom. It's a real pleasure to stand in your ranks. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for that extremely uh, compelling uh, presentation. I think everyone will have marked down your note that the right time for talk is any time. I was also struck by your phrase earlier in your remarks that the United States is seeking to modernize our presence so that we can exercise our rights. And it um, invited me to ask you if I can the first question we've seen in the conflict in Ukraine, how uh, quickly and imaginatively uh, the forces of Ukraine have been able to incorporate a genuinely diverse range of technologies and systems, including some that are very uh, modern. Can you say a few words about how you think emerging technologies, AI, quantum, cyber, uncrewed vehicles and the like, have a particular role in the mission of deterrence and defense in this theater? Well, thanks, John. Um this is really important to us. You know, if you look at our national defense strategy, uh, we talk about the importance of leveraging capability and capacity in all of the warfighting domains. Land, air, sea, space, cyberspace. And so our task is to go after those, uh, those capabilities that support our white warfighting concepts that that enable us to be not only successful uh, in, de in de deterring uh, uh, conflict, but also enable us to be dominant in any future uh, contest. So as we go after those capabilities to support our warfighting concepts, we're looking to 
bring things together and synchronize them and network them in ways that we've not done before. So we're going after capabilities like, you mentioned quantum computing, edge computing, uh, AI, and, uh, and a number of other things. It's one thing to say that, but I think you have to make an effort to invest in the right kinds of things and align your budget to, to match what your strategy is. So we, we went through great pains to link our budget request to our strategy, line by line almost, and it's, the be it's probably the best I've ever seen. I applaud my, uh, uh, the, the staff that, uh, that really did a tremendous job there. So it's one thing to, even when you get the capabilities, um, you have to make sure that you've organized your organization uh, to be able to manage those things, and then you have to drive yourself, drive the organization to success. I made a change to, uh, to our staff. I created a position um, that, uh, that oversees the, uh, uh, the integration of uh, dig our digital uh, work and also AI. So I have a chief digital and AI officer that uh, is really doing a phenomenal job of aligning the organization across the, across the board. So getting the capabilities is one thing, but then you've got to organize and you've got to drive to, uh, to create the capabilities that we're all looking for. Uh, and then you have to work with industry. And I know there are a number of industry leaders in this crowd, and uh, we make an effort, I make an effort to talk to industry leadership to tell them you know, where we want to go, what our needs are, and uh, you know, how we intend to employ the capabilities that we're asking for. And I, I would say that in the United States, you know, our industrial base is really one of our strategic advantages. But, you know, unless we're communicating the right things to industry, uh, we won't be where we need to be in the long term. So that, that remains a work in progress. But the kinds of things that you're talking about in terms of technology are the kinds of things that will help us maintain a competitive edge going forward. It is very important to us. It is fundamental to our, our, our uh, national defense strategy. And again, this is something that we remain cited on each and every day. Well, thank you very much. I'll take, if, with your permission, about three or four uh, from the floor. Don't uh, uh, worry about joining late. Um, I don't necessarily respect an absolute order of precedence, so I'll call on four or five people first. First, you mentioned uh, SecDef the Philippines, so Jeffrey Ordinell from the Philippines first. Hi, thank you. Um, so according to the 2022 report to Congress released by your department, sir, uh, if China continues the pace of its nuclear expansion, it will likely field a stockpile of about 1,500 warheads, and that's significant uh, given that the limit, legal limit to the U.S. Uh, operationally deployed nuclear warheads under the New START agreement is about 1,500. Um, and so that means China will achieve nuclear parity with the United States in about 15 years. Uh, my question is, are there any updates on U.S. efforts to push for some sort of an arms control deal with China, and are your Asian allies involved in, uh, in that kind of discussion? Thank you. Uh, let me begin this by saying uh, we are serious about our commitment to extended deterrence. And I have spoken with our allies and partners in the room uh, a number of times on this particular issue. And you should know that the President of the United States and all of us are very serious about this commitment. But in terms of specific updates on uh, engagements with uh, uh, with. Uh, the PRC on arms control. Uh, no, I don't have any updates for you there. You got to talk to them first. So as soon as they answer the phone, maybe we'll we'll get some work done here. From the United States, Bonnie Glazer. Thank you, John. Uh, Secretary Austin, senior Chinese officials are communicating to their foreign counterparts that the United States is seeking to goad China into using force against Taiwan. This is reminiscent of the October surprise in 2020, when China seemed convinced that the United States was trying to precipitate a crisis in the South China Sea. So I agree, dialogue, especially purposeful dialogue, is essential. If you had the opportunity to meet with General Lee, what would you tell him about U.S. objectives in the Taiwan Strait beyond the fact 
that the United States supports maintenance of the status quo and opposes use of force? Well, thanks for the question. Let me say up front that I respectfully disagree with the premise of the question in that we are trying to goad China into a conflict. It's in fact just the opposite. Uh, we are doing everything in our power to make sure that we maintain a free and open Indo-Pacific uh, because, as I said uh, earlier uh, in my remarks, this is important to all of us in this region. Um, in, in terms of, you know, what I would say to, uh, to my counterpart, well, you know, I, again, uh, with respect to Taiwan, it's the same thing that I said to him the last time, and that is our, our policy has not change, changed, and, uh, and we uh, do not seek, we do not desire to see a, a change, a unilateral change by, by any party. And so, um, you know, any kind of disagreements ought to be resolved through diplomacy. And again, it's important to maintain peace and stability in this region, as I mentioned earlier. Conflict in the Straits would affect the global uh, economy, in ways that we cannot imagine. So, but thanks for the question. So, then from China, Xi Jinping. Thank you, Dr. Chipman. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. The theme of our plenary session here is U.S. leadership. But how to play the role of leadership? On one hand, you claim to support the centrality of ASEAN in the region. On the other hand, the U.S. established multilateral institutions such as Quad and AUKUS. Is there any contradiction between U.S.-led institutions and the centrality of ASEAN in the region? How to guarantee ASEAN centrality? Thank you. I don't think I got the entire gist of the question, but uh, it, I think your question was centered on AUKUS uh, in and whether or not that either that promotes uh, security and stability in the region or, or drives us to, uh, uh, to conflict. It absolutely promotes greater stability and security. Uh, it provides uh, a valued and highly capable uh, ally with additional capability that I think will be a generational capability. Uh, and, and so, uh, I am confident that this will, this will add uh, greater stability and security to this region. I am proud of the work that we're doing uh, with AUKUS. Uh, and I, I know my good friends, uh, um, my colleagues from uh, Australia and the UK are here, and I look forward to having additional discussions with them uh, about, uh, about AUKUS and uh, updating our progress. But I, I think this will add significantly to our efforts to maintain peace and stability in the region. And from Vietnam, Bich Tran. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chipman, uh, uh, Secretary. Uh, so uh, you mentioned Vietnam is one of the important partners of the United States uh, in this region. So, so I wonder whether, you know, uh, I think that it says a lot about uh, the United States respect uh, the different political system of Vietnam. So I wonder whether you agree that being a communist is not a problem, be, but, but being a revisionist may be another issue. Thanks. So kind of differentiate between a communist state and a revisionist state. I heard you say being a communist is not a problem, uh, but being a revolutionary is an issue. But hey, listen, uh, we we don't we are focused on what you heard me talk about earlier, and that is making sure that we maintain uh, peace, security, and stability in this region, and we maintain access to um, international airways and waterways. We don't. In our partnerships and our alliances, we don't ask people to choose or countries to choose between us and, so, and, and another country. We don't ask country and impose our will on countries. You know, again, we want to work on those things that are that are common, of common interest to all of us, to both of us. So, I'll leave it at that. From France, Francois Bourg. Thank you very much uh, for your statements and for recalling also the, uh, the role 
uh, which some of the, uh, your European partners are playing in the region. Uh, you emphasized uh, that uh, you are in favor of the status quo on Taiwan and that conflict was neither imminent nor inevitable. Uh, those are obviously very welcome statements. Yet we have been hearing over the last couple of years a number of active duty, high ranking American officers uh, actually talk about imminence, 2025 and 2027 being the most frequently cited dates. Are we going to continue uh, to hear active duty, high ranking American officers uh, take that line? Or will there be, as we would put it in French, silence dans les rangs, uh, uh, silence in the ranks? <laughs> <laughs> First of all, um, I believe what they are pointing to in some cases uh, is the fact that President Xi challenged his military to, to develop the capabilities to conduct military operations by 2027. Uh, it doesn't mean that he's made a decision to do that. Um, in, in terms of whether or not our officers, you know, what they will say in the future, they have the ability to say what, they, what they're thinking. And, uh, you know, we always welcome that. But my opinion is that uh, a conflict is neither imminent or, it, or is it inevitable. And so... Uh, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that we're doing the right things to maintain the status quo. But, you know, the way that you deter uh, any uh, misguided uh, decision is by having a combat-credible military, uh, and, and we have one, and we will continue to have one. And our officers that are in charge of maintaining that combat-credible force uh, have to remain focused on making sure that they are ready to address any situation or circumstance. I know my indo pacom commander is in the room somewhere and he'd be the first to stand up and tell you, boss, you've charged me to do that and by golly, I am going to be ready no matter what happens. And that's what I want him to do. But again, I don't think that a, that a conflict is inevitable, nor do I think at this point that it's imminent. And from the Netherlands and the IISS, Billy Newens. Secretary of Defense, you made mention to the UK, Germany, and France in the Indo-Pacific. I wanted to ask, how important is it for the United States, for European countries to be engaged militarily in the Indo-Pacific? How important is it for uh, European militaries to be engaged militarily in the Indo-Pacific? How does it add value to the effort, I think is the... Well, the first thing I'll tell you is we're not trying to create uh, a NATO in the Indo-Pacific. And I, we have a, a number of colleagues here today from, uh, uh, from, from Europe. And I'm really glad to see them here because they all have interests in this region. Uh, and those interests uh, are not just military. They, they're, you know, they cover a uh, whole of government. And, and so uh, they would tell you that they have an interest in the region because of all the great things that happen here. So, and and uh, Prime Minister Albanese uh, talked about some of those things yesterday. The rate at which this region is growing, you know, the capability, the, the, the capacity that this region has, it is, it is rightful that, uh, that, that uh, European countries uh, would remain interested in, uh, in making sure that we have good relationships with the countries here in the region. And, and I'm confident that that's why they're here. But they'll probably tell you themselves because you'll see, you'll interact with them later on in the day. Absolutely right. And from Indonesia, Dewi Fortuna Anwar. Th thank you, John. Uh, I'd like to ask about the, the relations uh, between the court and ASEAN. Uh, as, as you know, uh, the uh, secretary, as you know, there have been a lot of uh, initial skepticisms and concern that the court may undermine ASEAN centrality. But I'm very happy to hear again, that, you know, the, uh, you have stressed again the ASEAN centrality. Uh, and recently, President Widodo actually said that, you know, Kuwait and ASEAN are not competitors. They are, they could be partners. Now, I'd like to tease out more. Do you envisage a Kuwait ASEAN as an institution cooperation, or is it the Kuwait and individual ASEAN countries cooperation? 
given the fact that all Quad countries are also members of the East Asia Summit. So what would be the format of such cooperation? Thank you. I think it's a question about the complex Rubik's Cube of the regional architecture in this region and how each of these different minilateral and established multilateral arrangements interconnect. Well, you know, I, I think uh, we, we should take what we have, and which, which is what we've done and what we'll continue to do, in terms of bilateral, trilateral, and multilateral uh, um, alliances and partnerships and, and build on those uh, incrementally. Again, I don't think we should, we should uh, drive things uh, to, uh, to go in one direction or another. We're not trying to create uh, a NATO uh, in the Indo-Pacific. We value our relationships with our, with our allies and partners. Uh, and each of our allies and partners has, uh, I mean, they have their own self-interest, uh, and, uh, and I, we understand that, and we want to make sure that we're helping them uh, protect their self-interest and that they, when possible, are working with us and with other countries to uh, provide for a free and open Indo-Pacific. Great. So I'm going to take two questions in succession and let the Secretary then answer those, and we'll conclude the session with that. My first of this duet is Sharon Nanau. Um, yes, sir. Uh, my question is um, on USA through this partnership and cooperation is pushing U.S. United States agenda into for smaller island states. Example, in the Solomon Islands, the U.S. was absent for over 20 plus years and only because of its diplomatic switch to China, they've reopened their embassy last year. So through this cooperation, you've mentioned allies and partners, but is it another form of pushing, pushing USA agendas, especially for smaller island states who don't have a leverage when coming to interacting with the developed or bigger countries. Thank you very much. He's got that on small island states and uh, their place in uh, U.S. engagement in the region and from Ireland, but also the Financial Times, uh, Dimitri Sevastopolo. Uh, thank you. And also a very small island state. Um, <laughs> Secretary Austin, good morning. Um, you've made a lot of progress creating a more lattice security architecture in the Indo-Pacific. But one thing that's missing is joint operational war plans with allies, particularly Japan and Australia, for Taiwan contingency. So my question is, how urgent is the need for joint operational war plans, and how hard is it proving to develop them? On, on the issue uh, of the importance of small island states, clearly uh, they are important. Uh, and I think you know that for uh, many of the uh, small island states, we've had uh, relationships uh, that go back for decades. Uh, we value and treasure those relationships. And if you look at uh, the number of, of people in some of those states that serve in the United States military, it really is impressive. So we want to make sure that we continue to build on those relationships uh, and continue to account for uh, your needs and your concerns. And you, most recently, you saw that the president at, held a summit where he had Pacific Islander uh, leadership uh, into the White House, and, uh, and it, was, uh, it was a great event. And, this, and I can tell you firsthand that this is really important to him. Uh, on the issue of uh, joint operational war plans, you probably know that I'm not going to discuss any kind of war plan in a forum like this. And what we're doing and not doing, but what I will tell you is that uh, it's important to uh, work hard to increase our interoperability. Uh, now, it's, you know, it's important to have, where possible, compatible platforms. Uh, it's really important to make sure that you have uh, you know, policies and procedures that, that serve you well and that you know, you're, you're your allies or partners understand uh, and are familiar with. But what, what happens when you work together as a joint or a combined force uh, is that uh, you, you continue to build trust among uh, your forces and the forces that, that, that you're working with. And at the end of the day, you can't surge trust. You know, it's got to be there 
uh, up front. And so I'm proud of the work that we're doing to increase interoperability in the region. Um, that interoperability will serve us well no matter what challenge presents itself. Uh, we have come a long way, but we are by no means where any of us want to be eventually. So we'll continue to work on that. And uh, for all of you that have uh, you provided uh, opportunities for my troops to work with your troops, let me say thanks again. I cannot tell you how important that is. In terms of specific plans, again, we don't discuss plans in, in, uh, in public forums. Uh, but uh, I will assure you that we will continue to work with our allies to make sure that we, we think about and account for future contingencies. John, thanks so much for allowing me to be here, and I guess we'll leave it at that. Absolutely. Since it's 9.30 and it just hit 9.31, so I want to thank you very much for your presentation. I want to ask everybody in the room to do two things. First, stay seated because the second plenary will start almost immediately as soon as our next three speakers are mic'd up. And secondly... And importantly, to thank the Secretary of Defense for his presentation and the conversation he's animated.